Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan. Today we welcome uh, His Excellency Sergei Konsunsky, uh, Ambassador of Ukraine in uh, Japan. <coughs> and uh, next week we probably, we hope to have also the uh, Russian Ambassador here in uh, Japan, we send out an invitation of him, for him, of course. Um, as you all know, uh, this is a very timely uh, press conference. Uh, Ukraine and Japan uh, were to be celebrating, or are still <laughs> planning to celebrate 30 years of diplomatic relations, but unfortunately, things developed in such a way that uh, there is uh, not much to celebrate, especially for Ukrainian people right now. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, there is a, a risk of uh, war uh, in uh, that country. Although uh, the last news are quite uh, positive, uh, I'm sure you followed their wires of tonight in Europe uh, yesterday night both the president of Ukraine and uh, the spokesperson for the government stated uh, on record that uh, there is no imminent danger for invasion, and they even uh, asked their people to somehow to be vigilant, but at the same time not to panic or whatever. So this is probably a good uh, sign. Uh, we are also all waiting for the written uh, answer that the United States have been uh, asked by the Russian to uh, give about uh, the future of uh, NATO and arrangement, uh, defense arrangement in uh, Europe. And uh, what else? We, we hope uh, that uh, with today's press conference, as we, the foreign press in Japan and the domestic press of Japan, will uh, have uh, a direct uh, uh, comment, a direct insight of the situation from our guest speaker, Ambassador Sergei Korsunsky. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, um, the Italian language is like the Japanese. We have a lot of vowel, vowels, but not so many <laughs> consonants. <laughs> OK, so Ambassador, go ahead and um, please turn off your uh, mobiles or put it in a silent mode if you have. Check it, please. Okay, those uh, are. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a big pleasure and honor to be with you today. Uh, it is true that uh, of this day, 30 years ago, Ukraine and Japan has exchanged notes establishing diplomatic relations between two countries. Uh, since then, we developed our relations uh, as a global partners. We are friends. We share mutual values of freedom, democracy. We have common view on security challenges of the contemporary world. Uh, we cooperate in many areas. And uh, uh, I am very um, uh, positively inclined to develop this, uh, uh, our cooperation uh, to, future, uh, to uh, further levels. Uh, and uh, I would love to continue to speak about our achievements and our plans. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, today it's much more important uh, to talk about what is going on around Ukraine, uh, because what is going on in Europe, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, it's not just about Ukraine. It will definitely affect uh, uh, global arena, and uh, uh, as far as uh, Japan, 10,000 kilometers far away, but uh, the globalized world we live in, uh, definitely, you, I hope you would agree with me uh, that uh, butterfly effect uh, uh, here will be uh, resonating uh, thousands of kilometers far and back. So that is why I would like to uh, share with you the, how I see the current situation around Ukraine, uh, where we are, and what is, uh, uh, how it may develop. 
I would like you to understand very clearly uh, the challenges and the threats uh, and how we, we see this uh, issue. Uh, let's begin in 2014, uh, February, uh, when uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, attacked in a hybrid manner, uh, sending uh, uh, Russian troops as green people, as they are famous now, without any insignia, without announcement of war. They just physically appeared uh, first in Crimea, uh, and then later on, uh, uh, they say the Crimea, uh, and a lot of events uh, until May, when uh, it was uh, illegal referendum was held, and finally, uh, uh, we now call this uh, illegal uh, attempt to annex Crimea, and uh, 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 Russia con uh, considers it's a part of uh, Russian Federation, and this is not recognized by international community. There are several United Nations General Assembly resolution on that. Uh, there are uh, bilateral and multilateral statements that, uh, except for a few uh, marginal countries, no one recognized Crimea as part of uh, uh, Russia. For us, it's the territory of Ukraine temporarily occupied. But uh, that would, was not the end. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Russian forces continued uh, aggression, and they supported uh, separatists in the eastern part of Ukraine, and those separatists were armed and trained and uh, pushed forward uh, to fight against the local, uh, the, uh, first local authorities, <coughs> then uh, central government forces. And finally, we have situation when part of eastern, two eastern regions, Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, um, uh, actually occupied by uh, Russian uh, uh, proxies, uh, supported by uh, uh, regular Russian forces, uh, that is all well documented through intelligence and through open observations, et cetera, et cetera. I'll try to show you some pictures a little bit later. Uh, so uh, eight uh, years uh, from those events, what we have now? Uh, we have now, on one hand, we have a political process uh, known as Minsk process based on a kind of... Uh, uh, agreement uh, reached uh, in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where some uh, measures were put on, 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 the, on the paper uh, how to resolve uh, issues in the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to discuss now details of those measures. It is clear that if they are realized uh, in how Russia sees, that would be no more independent Ukraine. So we, uh, we are uh, going to discuss those, and we discuss those measures. We, we want to stick to diplomatic solution in eastern part of Ukraine, but the consequences of measures, how it should be realized, uh, definitely they uh, should uh, take into account uh, that uh, uh, Ukrainian view about future, because it's future of our country. Uh, uh, we have 14,000 people killed. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, every day, until now, today, yesterday, we have, every day we have casualties uh, from Russian forces. Uh, and uh, what happened uh, very recently, uh, several weeks, a uh, couple of months if you want, uh, that we see, we witness a huge amount of Russian forces arriving at our border, uh, making the exercises, building camps, uh, and uh, actually, uh, 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 training themselves to attack Ukraine. Uh, uh, it is not nothing new. We have seen that before. But what is more uh, troubling now, we see arrival of massive forces from far east of Russia, from the Chinese-Russian border. So they now move forces from far east to Ukrainian border and build a second line of uh, military installations. Uh, every military officer will tell you that means a real preparation for attack. Because first way, uh, normally it, I mean, they will be literally destroyed. We have strong army. Uh, 100,000, it's a substantial number, but it's nothing uh, comparable to what uh, Russia may need to uh, occupy a substantial part of Ukraine. But second uh, line, that means that Russia is uh, being ready for 
a long-term assault. And that is uh, very uh, troubling for us. So therefore, uh, we see uh, as well, what we see, uh, we see the political process. You know that as uh, many, uh, there is a read myself, uh, because I, 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 that's how I prefer to learn things. I read, I read it myself in Russian media uh, and uh, different Russian sources. Uh, uh, about 15, 17 December, they put it like this is, that uh, world changing situation appeared. New world began on 17 of December. What happened? Russia presented two documents, two draft agreements uh, to NATO and to US, uh, requesting uh, something from the West, which is absolutely cannot be accepted. That is clear from the very beginning. If you just read this document, it doesn't matter whether you're Ukrainian, Japanese, Italian, or American. Those demands to return back to 1997, to move troops out of Bulgaria, Romania, to move troops out of Baltic states, to stop, uh, uh, to, to uh, reverse uh, many uh, decisions which were accepted in after, uh, after the um, uh, uh, several waves of uh, 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 NATO expansion. The, the, this is just not possible. So those ultimatums, that's very pecu peculiar documents because uh, Russia talks about European security. But let's zoom out and ask ourselves, what European security? Who feels insecure in Europe? Germans, Italians, French, Poland? We all feel secure in Europe. We are f absolutely comfortable in Europe. Nothing is happening in Europe. There is no conflict in Europe which may bring war as it was First World War, Second World War. But after that, we have uh, infrastructure of security. Uh, of course, it's based on NATO. But not every uh, nation uh, in Europe uh, uh, is a member of, of NATO. But we feel completely secure. The only one country which feels insecure, the biggest country in the world, with 6,000 500 nuclear warheads, army number two by every, by combined power after American. We are, by the way, 22. They are two, second army in the world, and they feel insecure. They say NATO uh, is threatening interests of Russia. Okay, how, how it's about coming to Ukraine? We don't have NATO bases in Ukraine. We, yes, we have training. Yes, we participate in many uh, NATO missions. But it's our sovereign right to uh, be friendly, to, to, to make friends, and to participate in security environment uh, on our choice. We are not threatening anybody. We never threaten Russia. We're never going to attack Russia. Thousand times we have said on every level, Ukraine is not going to attack Russia. Never, ever. We are not going to resolve uh, issue of Donbass by force. We stick to negotiations. We try to find out every possible compromise to move forward. Full stop. What we have, that's yesterday. I was pleased to see a statement from Mr. Peskov, who said that we are very much concerned about concentration of Ukrainian troops along the separation line in Donetsk and Lugansk. So that means if Russia have uh, 150,000 troops on their territory along our border, that's normal. If we have concentrated troops on our border, this is abnormal. So uh, the aggressors say uh, about the uh, possible victim, Yo, no, you, should, you should not even try to think to uh, fight against us. You have just to give up and accept your destiny. And your destiny to be vassals of the, uh, Russia because we are the same nation, the same people, which is, uh, I'm, again, I'm not going to uh, enter into historical, who is first, who is second, and who is, uh, uh, it's uh, just uh, everyone who was in Moscow can go again and see what the monument in front of the Moscow mayor office. It's a monument to Yuri Dolgoruki, Kiev prince, who founded Moscow in 12th century. At that time, Kiev existed for 600 years, but it's okay. Now I would like you to, uh, show, uh, to see you some pictures and I specifically have chosen pictures from internationally responsible media. So it's not our propaganda. It's Financial Times, it's Reuters, uh, it's uh, New York Times. Uh, so that's, you see Ukraine, you see Russia, and you see where the 
uh, their forces concentrated. And for some reason, I don't know why, on those pictures they don't show uh, Russian forces on Belarusian territory. Uh, but right now we see a very heavily, uh, 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 I mean, um, uh, saturated with troops, with uh, people and equipment, and they have now uh, military trainings on, in Belarus too. So please, uh, if you can, we, we can move further uh, on pictures. Uh, that's another picture from New York Times. Uh, basically, they are speaking the same, so there is some major. But what I would like you to ask you, please pay attention to geography. Please pay attention where those troops have been concentrated. And later on, please, next slide. Uh, that's uh, satellite pictures, that's Raiders, that's OEC mission, uh, that's somebody else I don't remember. So that is a military basis of Russia uh, today because it's, as you see, it's winter and you see uh, the, their equipment. Uh, a very peculiar picture, OEC on the right uh, uh, um, uh, corner, you see two tanks. One is firing toward Ukraine, one is firing back. Those two Russian tanks, that's how Russia uh, present us. Uh, they say that's Ukrainian provocations. That's how they do it. That's this OEC mission picture. It's not ours. There are dozens of those pictures. It's just one example. Please, next picture. Uh, there are several scenarios about possible military actions of Russia. Those, they are very important. Please pay attention. The most, uh, uh, two first, they're most, uh, mostly uh, deeply discussed. First, that's upfront attack from east and uh, north part of Ukraine, uh, moving from uh, Russian bases to up to the Dnipro River. So this is uh, how they stop all those. This is, uh, you know, it's a huge river, very wide. It's difficult to get uh, 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 over it. So first, it's Kyiv on the north and major cities uh, in the east. And that uh, some assault probably will be from Crimea. Uh, that is one scenario uh, which has been discussed. That's pictures from uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies of the United States. Analysis, very deep, deep uh, analysis done by professional uh, military uh, great people. So I just want to show you uh, basically all of them around the same discussion. So those pictures are nice, um, uh, nice, uh, uh, nicely demonstrate what, what may happen. Another scenario on the right uh, with green uh, uh, dots, you see that possible uh, Russian invasion on the south. The, uh, the goal is to connect uh, Crimea to Russian territory by land. So to annex the, some, uh, some part of territory of Ukraine, uh, so-called Novorossiya, uh, uh, which is on the Azov Sea and which, which is adjacent uh, to Crimea and Odessa, and to connect uh, Russia to Pridnistrovia, which is part of uh, Moldova and uh, Crimea, uh, and that uh, would be uh, uh, supported by uh, attack from Sevastopol, so Black Sea uh, uh, fleet. Uh, and final uh, result could be a next wave of uh, attack on, uh, to occupy full territory of Ukraine until maybe the very west part, which is mountains, and uh, populated as, if you would listen to uh, Solovyov and Skabeyeva, populated with uh, almost Nazi, uh, uh, heavy uh, uh, nationalistic Ukrainians. So let them live, uh, who knows where, nobody cares about them. So that's basic three scenarios. Now, please, wait, look at this geography, because what I'm going to show you next is very important to understand. Please, next slide. This is infrastructure of Ukraine. So, ladies and gentlemen, if war is going to happen, that will be first ever in the history of mankind war against the country which has on its territory 15 nuclear, power, uh, nuclear reactors, which has 30,000 kilometers of gas and oil pipelines full with uh, gas and oil, and very uh, uh, big net network of chemical plants uh, through all the territory of Ukraine. Just imagine for just one second that this kind of attack would happen. Definitely, uh, you can't uh, take the uh, territory of Ukraine by land. It will be supported, and we have uh, 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 intelligence which says that there are 
uh, Iskander missiles brought to our border uh, on Russian territory still. Uh, if there is an uh, attack by uh, cruise missiles, if there is attack with airplanes, uh, if it, uh, the, it is impossible to avoid uh, the uh, serious uh, harm to infrastructure, uh, who will be responsible for those 15 nuclear power plants? Who will be then responsible if, uh, you know, I mean, Japan, you live in a country which uh, remembers 10 years ago what happened in Fukushima. Let me tell you, one reactor, if it's like, we have already Chernobyl. We spent, uh, I, I can't even say how much, probably around 30 or 50 billion dollars uh, to cope with this Chernobyl. And what will happen if one of those VVR 1000 would be destroyed, we will mm. see much worse. Uh, situation. And if you remember what happened in Chernobyl, 1986, uh, first reports about nuclear accidents came from Sweden and Scotland. If anything will happen, and on the south, uh, the closest, that's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, it's on uh, left side of the uh, bank of uh, uh, Dnipro River, and it is right on the line of possible attack uh, from Russian bases. So if all this infrastructure is destroyed, there is no more Ukraine, but if this, is, this is just one consequence. There is no more Central Europe, and probably the Western Europe will be affected too. We can't guarantee protection in case we have a full upfront attack of military forces from Russian Federation. Therefore, what is, what, what is our vision? Our vision, we have to reach an agreement uh, and uh, we have to uh, be part of this agreement. We have to understand very clearly that whatever will be put on paper or on the table between NATO, if NATO uh, would decide to do so, between the United States and Russia, if the United States and Russia would decide to do so, uh, the security environment, which will take into account a legitimate Ukrainian concern about future of our country, uh, including the resolution of the par problem in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, again, I would like to stress that we are committed fully for 1,000% for peaceful resolution of this problem. Again, I would like to say we are not going to attack anybody, neither in Donetsk and Lugansk, nor Russia or any other, uh, or Belarus or whatever. Just leave this alone, these this arg arguments, this complete nonsense to say that Ukraine is going to uh, resolve any issues from military force. We are fully committed to diplomatic solution, and we are going to be part of it, and we want to be part of it. As far as I know today, as if uh, it's in Paris, there will be meeting of uh, political advisors of Minsk Group. So Germany, uh, uh, France, uh, Ukraine, and Russia will meet, I mean, uh, on the level of uh, political advisors. And they will talk ab uh, about uh, uh, future steps in this Minsk process. What we want from Russia, we want to de-escalate to stop uh, 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 making uh, uh, seeding house uh, in Ukraine and in Europe. We are not afraid, absolutely not. If you talk to people in Kyiv, if you talk to people in Kharkiv, uh, in other cities in Ukraine, they're not afraid. We are now preparing territorial defense. We have majority of population ready to fight, but we are fully people, we, we are peaceful people, we want peaceful resolution. And we want to see that this is understanding is coming from our partners. Uh, we uh, work very closely with Japan, too. Uh, we expect that Japan will join G7 on their efforts as part of, uh, of G7 efforts to, uh, to resolve the issue, uh, to avoid military confrontation, and to support Ukrainian democratic uh, development uh, in, a peaceful, in a peaceful manner. So I urge Russian Federation uh, to stop uh, uh, exercise uh, uh, intimidation campaign and blaming Ukraine on whatever is happening uh, 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 absolutely in an absolutely artificial pretext that uh, uh, Ukrainian built up or uh, uh, that Ukraine is pumped with weapons. Yes, we pumped with weapons because we need them in case of attack. We cannot control uh, what uh, Moscow would decide to do. Uh, uh, if you listen uh, to Russian propaganda. This is uh, uh, mind-blowing uh, statements uh, from people in Duma, uh, politicians, experts, uh, academics, 
saying we have to bomb for Ukraine, we have to use tactical nuclear weapons, but this is true. We just listen to them. I mean, how you can be quiet, how you can be just co uh, complacent with what, uh, how you live in and continue as nothing happens, if you have uh, like uh, uh, senior representative like Mr. Tolstoy uh, saying that, I mean, this is our territory, we just have to take it and don't, we don't care what will happen to those Ukrainians. I mean, what is this? Uh, he is, he is a, a senior uh, uh, Russian representative even in the Council of Europe, I mean, Parliamentary Assembly in the Council of Europe. So uh, we, we, we want this to stop. Uh, and uh, let's sit and talk and let's find a diplomatic way out. And we rely on the support of uh, G7, as I say, first of all, from our strategic partners uh, like United States and uh, Britain. I, I would like to express as well uh, our deepest gratitude to those countries uh, who helps us not just by political statements, but with real terms. I think I should stop at that. And please, I'm ready to answer uh, questions. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank very you very much, much Ambassador. Thank you. Um, usually the moderator makes the uh, first uh, couple of questions, but I see that today the house is full, so I will uh, probably make the last question and I'll start with the floor right now. Um, please uh, raise your hand and uh, come to the microphone and state your name and affiliation if you have one. Ale <coughs> My name is Sergei Mengajev. I'm a Russian journalist, uh, chief of uh, Russian State Television Bureau in Tokyo. Actually, I have two questions to Mr. Ambassador. The first one is, well, the United States and its allies say that uh, Russia will face severe consequences if it attacks Ukraine. But this if uh, clearly suggests that there are no Russian troops in Ukraine, which sounds contradictory to what Ukrainian government has been telling all these years up until now because you were explaining to the world that you were fighting against uh, Russian aggressors and now it appears that they even haven't crossed the border yet. So my first question is who actually you were fighting with? Citizens of what country? Ukrainian in Donbas, in Donetsk and Lugansk. Are they, are they Ukrainian citizens or Russian invaders who, as we can see, haven't crossed the border yet. And the second question is, uh, are there any plans in Ukrainian government to start a new uh, full-fledged attack in Donbass? Because if Kyiv decides to surpass the resistance in Donetsk and Lugansk by sheer military force, Russia, in order to prevent the massacre and destruction of those people by lethal weapons you're receiving from Western countries, might take some actions that you probably will consider as Russian uh, interference, Russian invasion. But anyway, are there any plans of Ukrainian government, uh, considering that you're concentrating, you're also concentrating forces uh, at the, okay. uh, not far from the front, are there any plans to start a new full-fledged military attack in Donbass? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. I thought I already stated that we are not going to attack uh, Donbass or uh, any other part of uh, uh, occupied uh, territories, uh, uh, including Crimea. We want to resolve every issue in a manner uh, of negotiations and through international pressure on Russia because uh, uh, there is uh, absolutely clear that uh, uh, but, uh, okay, we, I mean, it, it's not about Crimea, but uh, you, you know that well, that Crimea is now saturated with uh, uh, military forces beyond imagination, but uh, Russian military forces. But even uh, uh, if we talk about Donbass, uh, it is uh, confirmed many times uh, on every possible level up to the uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly that uh, there are Russian weapons there are a lot of d d documented presence of regular Russian forces in temporarily occupied areas of Donbass and Lugansk. Uh, Russia issued, uh, if I'm not mistaken, something between 600,000 and million Russian passports to those people who live on those uh, uh, temporarily occupied territories. 
So uh, uh, a, a, what is this? Why are you doing this? Uh, why, why, how this idea even came to your mind to issue passports to people who, who are citizens of Ukraine, who live, as you say, on Ukrainian territory, you are not going to recognize independence, but you issue passports on their territory, uh, uh, on this territory. Uh, this is a clear provocation. This is a clear creation of pretext for future attack. Uh, as I show you picture how those two tanks firing in different directions simultaneously, there are zillion of those examples of uh, uh, provocations. And that is exactly the message we hear from the highest level from Kremlin, that uh, 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 that is uh, that's Ukrainians are going to do chemical weapons or something. I mean, it's, when you listen, you don't believe this is this is Russian language. We we understand Russian, as you may guess, very well. Uh, I'm, <coughs> my mother is from Russia, so please, I I, I, I understand what they're saying. Uh, this is complete nonsense. We don't have chemical weapons. We are not going to <coughs> use them. So how many times we have to tell this? We are a peaceful nation. What we want? Get out of Donbas move your troop out, let us take off the border, then at the international supervision, OSCE, whatever, whatever, whatever model will be found, sorry, I, I, I'll answer. There will be elections, then we will take care over our citizens on our territory. There will be no massacre. It's not a, question, it's not a word from our lexicon. But if you're in Kyiv, well, when you will visit Kyiv one day, Come to uh, uh, foreign ministry, and you will see St. Michael Monastery, and you will see a long, long wall with faces of people killed by Russian forces in the eastern part of Ukraine. 14,000 people. For what? Who, who, is going, who, who, who is massacre? There, is no Russian troops in Donbass. there are Russian troops in Donbass. This is very well documented so clearly. Sanctions, sanctions but, but wait a minute. Don't, they're talking about new wave of sanctions, as they call health sanctions. There are sanctions in place. For what? Now, now in place, you have long list of sanctions. EU, US, G7, on whatever level you want. I mean, uh, you, you have uh, Mr. Timofeyev, uh, Russian Council for Foreign Relations, great expert. Ask him, Ivan Timofeyev. He will explain okay. what kind of sanctions they, uh, you have now. A long list of sanctions. Why? because of Russian actions in the eastern in okay. part of Ukraine. Sorry, too. let's not make it a debate uh, between you two. Uh, if we have time, uh, Sergei, we'll, Go ahead. I'll, I'll yeah. give you, you... You want to make a short uh, follow-up? Yeah, but go to the microphone, otherwise it's not going to be recorded. Please make it short. Actually, my first question was, who you were fighting with? Ukrainian citizens or okay. Russian citizens? Because 14,000 people killed and 10,000 of them were on the side of Donbass in l people of Lug Lugansk and Donetsk. Okay, the question Who is No, this were is not true. By? We the are talking about 14,000 Ukrainian military people uh, uh, killed by Russian uh, at, uh, forces for eight years of war in the eastern part of Ukraine. Okay, let's go to the uh, another question. Who is... Uh, once those up. Uh, hello, Ambassador. Nice to meet you. My name is Tatsuya Sato from Japanese newspaper Asa Shinbun. Uh, forgive, forgive, forgive me uh, to ask a very straightforward. Uh, in your country, is there such kind of idea that um, kind of uh, to give uh, your uh, country eastern part to like um, Russian deported eastern part eastern part uh, of your country to uh, Russia instead of uh, you can join to uh, NATO uh, do you have um, in your country such kind of idea is there okay uh, <coughs> if I understood the question correctly that means whether we're going to give up our eastern part yeah. to Russia I don't see how uh, those issues uh, a, a, could be connected. A bargain. You, you could uh, ah, you you give, give up that part. And we join and NATO. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Well, no. <laughs> Simple question is no. Things happen uh, in the world. First, it is, it is uh, not possible. You, you know, we, we mm -hmm. have two million people uh, from Donbass uh, and Lugansk uh, temporarily occupied. Uh, 
uh, now displaced. Uh, they live throughout Ukraine now. And their people lost their homes. Uh, they still have relatives. Uh, and it is not possible to imagine that we just say simply, you know, take it and let us join uh, NATO. Uh, we, uh, it, is, it, is, it is absolutely impossible to imagine. Uh, we want, as, as I said many times, we want to negotiate a normal, uh, clearly structured mechanism to resolve this issue through, uh, uh, through the diplomacy and through uh, uh, moderated by respectable uh, international institutions uh, uh, mechanism how we will reintegrate Donbass back to Ukraine. It will be very difficult, very difficult. <clears throat> but this is what we are committed. So uh, uh, about NATO membership, uh, uh, you know where we are with NATO. Uh, uh, right now, we are in the process of uh, the door is open, but this process probably will take uh, more year, uh, uh, much more years than we expected before. Uh, but we believe, uh, not in the fact, this fact is, never, uh, is not now, now happening. We believe in the freedom of every nation to choose its own uh, security environment. Otherwise, if we just allow as a principle that somebody may dictate you what to do uh, to protect yourself, we will be live in complete chaos, complete chaos in the world. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador. I have a, a question from the online, from Jess Jensen, Japan Times. <clears throat> uh, given that Washington has signaled that it sees Europe as a secondary theater after the Indo-Pacific and that it specifically wants to focus on China. Do you think that the price for a strong US response and commitment to resolving the Ukraine crisis may be too high and that Biden administration will instead devote its limited resources to deterring the invasion of Taiwan? And let me add, uh, that, in, as you may remember, in 19, uh, 2005, there was uh, uh, the situation in Georgia, if you remember. And at that time, the United States were very strongly supporting and encouraging Saakashvili to get tough on the uh, Russians. Mm -hmm. But uh, after a few weeks, uh, they kind of let him alone. And uh, the end, we all know the end, what was it? <coughs> uh, very good question. Uh, let, me, let me answer uh, in, a, in, in such a way. Uh, it is not uh, a, an issue of particular territory or particular territorial claim from one country to another. It's a matter of principle. The matter of principle that no force should be used to change borders of other nation. That's basic thing, and we have to maintain that. Doesn't matter whether we talk about Ukraine or Taiwan. Uh, uh, Taiwan is a very complicated issue, and I don't want to discuss it because it's uh, for professionals who are dealing with this issue for many years, and uh, we have to go <coughs> back to 1948, et cetera, et cetera. But when, when it comes to Ukraine, uh, you, s you see this parallel in, th in dozens of publications throughout the world, uh, because everyone now watch what is going to happen around Ukraine. If Russia is allowed to, to move forward with force, then we will see many more such examples in other parts in the world. It's not just about Taiwan. How about Senkaku? I mean, uh, those issues are uh, maybe they are not the most uh, acute, uh, but but they they, they are exist. They, they exist and they have been discussed mm -hmm. in the Sorry international. Sorry to interrupt you. The Ukraine recognizes uh, Taiwan or China? China, of China. course, China. Uh, uh, China is our biggest trade partner, by the way, and uh, China uh, is very positive about uh, developing relations with Ukraine. We, we have nothing against that. Uh, we, you can't ignore such a power. China is a great country. We, everybody re, uh, recognizes that and understands that. China is huge, and you have to uh, understand that well uh, China vision of, of the world. Uh, but again, the, this principle must be maintained in a very uh, uh, comprehensive manner. Uh, we all learned from, uh, from previous conflicts. That is why I am stating once again, we are not going to use force. We are not in this position. Uh, we want uh, Russia 
uh, which you, you just imagine that if this war would happen, China needs no territory. It's not overpopulated. Uh, Russia, sorry, yeah. uh, Russia. It's not. They don't need any territory. It's not overpopulated. Uh, it's ridiculous to say they need resources. I mean, who else have res all the resources yeah. in the world if not Russia? So, what the pretext to attack Ukraine? We are the same nation. NATO threatens Russia. Well, I mean, how how it comes to Ukraine? Uh, it is unexplainable for, uh, and uh, completely unacceptable for international uh, law mm -hmm. point of view. So that is why. Uh, we, we stick to the idea uh, that uh, uh, issue of Taiwan, yes, it is connected to what is happening in Ukraine, but it is connected from the point of view of international law and the principles of the new world order which is coming. We understand that the previous model uh, is probably coming to an end. Probably this kind of liberal democracy principles, etc., all this framework uh, probably will need to change somehow. The question is how, and we, the question is what we put instead of that. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, when uh, it was developed in the 50s, 60s, after the Second World War, there was no China, <coughs> it, it, as minimum. And you have now superpower, and you have to ad uh, accept that's a completely different reality. And the world is so interconnected that it is not possible to see that in one part, it will be used of force. In another part, it will be completely peaceful and uh, uh, follow the principle of international law. Unfortunately, this is not going to happen. Talking about China, you remember that Georgia exploded during the Beijing Olympics. And we have another and Olympics next, now. Yes. Next week, uh, uh, Putin is meeting with Xi Jinping. Do you expect China to play a peaceful role and talk it over to Putin? Uh, uh, it is, you know, a billion-dollar question. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to speculate on that. But I am sure that uh, it is not in Chinese interest taking into account uh, this uh, concept of uh, one, uh, one belt, one road, the major concept of Xi Jinping. Uh, you know that was his idea uh, uh, since 2013. Uh, and if you remember, there is a framework of uh, 17 plus 1 or 16 plus 1 in Central Europe uh, that China was nurturing for many years, trying to develop, because that was the goal of One Belt, One Road, the destination. It's European market. So 16 plus 1, forget about it if a major war uh, in Ukraine would begin. Uh, just forget about it. Central Europe will be in deep house. Uh, and uh, that is uh, not, in, from my point of view, it's not in Chinese interests. So, so far, we understand that China supports peaceful resolution of problems around Ukraine. Uh, and that is uh, from where I would like to see developments. Uh, what will happen between uh, uh, two biggest friends, uh, 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 Russia and China, I don't know. But uh, I would like to do, draw your attention. Maybe you, don't, you didn't pay it. Uh, there, is, there are 26 grades of how China uh, put uh, relations with other countries, 26 different uh, uh, like levels. Uh, uh, on Where the, is Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine is in the middle, uh, uh, right in the middle. But of course, the paramount that's Russia, that's strategic, special strategic relations in new era or something like that. So uh, uh, there could not be bigger, uh, better relations. This is a public uh, data. Or? Yes, yes, it's published. Uh, there are researchers who did uh, specific. Uh, there is an article uh, which I read uh, with huge interest because they analyzed all the agreements China has with other countries. Uh, they have put it in the framework of language mm. uh, and uh, substance, because uh, sometimes it's free trade. This <coughs> is important. I wonder where is Japan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll ask them later. It's different issue. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's uh, continue with the floor. Other questions? <coughs> Lady? Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Ogawa from Japanese newspaper Nikkei. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, as you mentioned, the proposal uh, from Russia about European security uh, is unacceptable. So what kind of political agreement is possible, in your opinion? And uh, the second question is, 
Are you satisfied with Japan's attitude towards this issue so far? That's all. Uh, two very important uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, I do believe uh, that there are a very substantial discussions between the United States and Russia on what kind of uh, framework could be found to satisfy Russian demands uh, that they are, uh, as they say, as Russia say, legitimate concerns about security issues would, should be taken. Uh, I think there are much more uh, uh, discussions with, than we can imagine going uh, uh, without public, uh, quietly, uh, because, I mean, normally, uh, big, uh, I mean, uh, big states, they talk to each other in very comprehensive manner from different points of view. Uh, we will see. Uh, what will come out of out of it? I do think that uh, there could be uh, some issues uh, discussed and accepted by both sides. But if you want my personal, uh, I would like to stress that my personal vision. I think it is kind of a little bit uh, strange to discuss European security without Europeans. I think uh, that uh, the framework of security is wider than just European security. Uh, the framework of security is global. Uh, probably uh, nations uh, uh, far beyond European uh, geography uh, must participate in those discussions. And very well, uh, very, we have very good examples right before the, right few days before the new year. Uh, the statement from uh, United Nations permanent, uh, five uh, m permanent m members of the Security Council, uh, United Nations Security Council was, uh, they issued a statement about uh, uh, nuclear war, so that uh, it is not going to happen. It's not possible, and all those five nuclear states, they like uh, say so. Uh, this is a huge statement. But let me ask you one simple question, which I cannot avoid to ask myself. There are three other nations with nuclear weapons, which did not say so. India, Pakistan, and North Korea. So what we, I mean, okay, those five say no. How about those three? I do believe they say no too. But what I mean that every, any framework you take into account is wider, which was created 50 years ago or 70 years ago. So now we have look at the world much wider uh, projection. And if we talk about uh, uh, de uh, deployment of uh, 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 middle range missiles, how about uh, Etorofo Island? Is it? And the, uh, would fall into the agreement which will be reached for Europe or not? Uh, how about other places in the world? So the question is that uh, the framework that just as it was, if you remember those nice 80s, Reagan, Gorbachev, Reykjavik, all those agreements, Razryadka, uh, 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 as they saw, uh, say it in Russian, uh, uh, so they were reached between, at that time, Soviet Union and United States were just two of them who would decide what is going to happen with security in the global framework. But now we have different world. We have different environment. We have, unfortunately, we have more countries with nuclear weapons and we have uh, second economy in the world, uh, the Ch China, which is, uh, which like falls out of this. Uh, I think this is a global issue and uh, my personal vision, I would say that uh, it should be discussed on the global arena. Uh, that will be something which can bring us to security in real terms, not just in speculative terms. Uh, speculative means that you have a handgun uh, and the Ukrainian head and you demand something from uh, United States. That is exactly how it looks like right now. Uh, 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 I served in Washington. I know how Washington works. I know how they think. I do think they will find out uh, the model of discussion with Russian Federation, uh, and w they will look for compromise. The question is, we want to see compromise from other side too, not ultimatums, not the language, as Mr. Ryabkov, Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia said, uh, and I hope you agree, he said, this is not a menu. You have, you can choose. You have to accept this as a, you know, uh, uh, altogether, uh, obentu, you know, this is kind of, uh, whatever inside you have to eat it. Uh, it's not going to happen. This is not a normal way to negotiate. Okay. <coughs> Other questions from the floor? <coughs> the, the Lady first. 
<coughs> Thank you for coming today. My name is Karine Nishimura, working from, uh, for French uh, Liberation newspaper as well as a radio station. Uh, my question is about the position of uh, Amer United States and uh, UK and France and other countries. It seems that there is a quite a difference. Uh, <coughs> United States uh, as well as uh, UK have an uh, alarmist position and France and other countries say keep uh, quiet keep and uh, uh, work for a peace peaceful solution. What do you think of about this uh, difference? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I would say uh, we two things. First, we are very grateful to United States and Great Britain, and we are very disappointed with the position of Germany. Uh, uh, when it comes to France, I understand that now France is trying to play uh, a, a good cop uh, model. So that's today. That is why today uh, all four uh, councillors will meet uh, uh, in, in Paris uh, to talk about a possible diplomatic solution. I do think that both uh, approach, uh, they have their reasons uh, to, to develop. Uh, 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 normally, uh, intelligence should tell uh, governments, foreign governments, about what, is it, w w w what could happen. Uh, and if we uh, listen to statements from uh, United States, from Great Britain, from other countries, uh, we see uh, very, uh, uh, serious concern about uh, numbers and quality of troops of Russian Federation on our border, uh, and the numbers are increasing, not decreasing. Uh, the new uh, uh, new waves of equipment like tanks and uh, other uh, machines are coming to uh, close to our border and to Belarus. Uh, now we see several at the same time, simultaneously, several naval uh, exercises uh, going on with Russian fleet in different parts of the world. All this uh, for probably considered by uh, uh, those powers, I mean, like United States and Great Britain, as a very uh, serious uh, point of very serious concern. Uh, in Europe, we see a little bit, as you rightfully say, uh, uh, completely, a little bit different attitude, not completely, but a little bit different. Uh, and uh, uh, there are attempts uh, from uh, 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 Germany and France, particularly, as those two uh, nations uh, uh, which, uh, which are responsible, I mean, not responsible, but which are part of the means process, <coughs> uh, to try to, to uh, organize uh, kind of urgent consultations and to, to find uh, 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 compromises around the issues uh, of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, uh, let's hope uh, they will achieve something. That's our uh, best best hope. If uh, those councillors would, would find a, a, a solution, uh, a compromise, uh, and then uh, on that, that basis, uh, we will see de-escalation. We will be the happiest in the world. We, we don't we want to develop. Uh, we have uh, a lot of trouble with Omicron. We have a lot of trouble with energy crisis. We need to work on peaceful issues and uh, economic issues rather than uh, on military. It's not our choice. We have to do uh, what, what, what we are doing uh, as a responsible government. So uh, I think that uh, a little bit strange to listen to the position of Germany because we know exactly how much weapons Germany supplies to other countries. And uh, when it comes uh, suddenly to Ukraine, uh, they're very uh, partial, I would say. Uh, <coughs> but uh, it's, it's reality we, we live in. So we would uh, just have uh, later on, when we are out of this crisis, we have to very carefully to evaluate uh, what was happening, why it was happening, and how we can proceed uh, further. Right now, it is important to de-escalate and to, uh, uh, to resolve the normal uh, means process, discussions, and uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, uh, seeking for diplomatic solution. May I suggest the key of interpretation for Germany position? As you know, <clears throat> there is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, which is a My beloved. <laughs> big, uh, big issue in Europe. And <clears throat> uh, 
as everybody knows, I think uh, this is a pipeline that bypasses Ukraine and will bring uh, gas directly to Europe. And as you know, now in Europe, uh, also in my country, there are a lot of uh, issues about the rise of the, of the price. So don't you think that this is somehow linked? Uh, 100% it is linked. And uh, okay. I've been doing energy security for 25 years. And since the beginning of this project, it was absolutely clear for us, it was absolutely clear for Central European nations that this is a political project. This has absolutely no economic sense. Uh, Ukraine was always a reliable partner in, in gas transportation, and we, we, we were uh, we still ready to continue to do this business if we have normal relations with Russia, uh, and uh, Europeans have nothing against that. Uh, uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, it's a political tool uh, to intimidate Europe, because just imagine, I mean, let me, uh, I'm, I'm not going to discuss in detail all those stories, because it's long, uh, we don't have time, but what Russia is doing, once Nord Stream is, will be operational, right at that moment, they will physically destroy infrastructure on Russian territory, which lead to Ukrainian gas transportation system. We know that. They have physically remove pipelines from the ground, not to allow us to, to be ever, ever, uh, to be part of this uh, gas transportation business. But wait for a second. But if anything happened to this Nord Stream 2, this is just a piece of metal. I mean, this is technology. Everything may happen, uh, uh, not because of uh, uh, some special uh, activity or terrorism, just for nat natural course. What Europe will be doing, because this is 110 uh, cubic meters of uh, Russian gas will be going from Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, uh, to Germany and to Europe. If, it, if it's just cut off, what are you going to do? How you can <coughs> substitute it uh, in real terms? So that is why we think this is absolutely counterproductive to put this project forward, and definitely this is part of uh, uh, rapprochement between Germany and Russia. This is no question about that. Talking about gas, I have a related question here, but a little bit southern, from our um, Vice President uh, Ilgin from BBC World Turkish. Mm. Uh, she sends two questions out <clears throat> relating with Turkey somehow. Uh, first of all, uh, Turkey is a, a NATO country with good relation with both Russia and Ukraine, has uh, proposed uh, through their president Erdogan to defuse the tensions between the two countries. Uh, what is uh, the reaction of your go government and uh, to your knowledge, what is the reaction of Russian side to this offer? And the second question is related to gas. Uh, I would like to ask about energy security of Europe. Right now, Russia bypasses Ukraine to ship EU gas via Turkey, via the new pipeline system called the Tur Turkish Stream. Yeah. Uh, what happens to this deal in case of Russia invading Ukraine? Uh, thank you very much. I served eight years as ambassador to Turkey, so to <laughs> Turkey is for me is like homeland. So uh, let me let me say first, uh, we deeply res uh, grateful and respect uh, uh, relations with Turkey. We have strategic partnership, and I am very proud it happened during my term in in the country, 2011. So we uh, definitely uh, uh, Turkey uh, is trying to play a very uh, important role in the region, and they are playing an important role in the region. This is a very uh, serious army in NATO. It's second army uh, in NATO. Uh, they control Bosphorus. Uh, this is a very strong maritime presence in the Black Sea. Uh, and definitely, Turkey works very closely, both with Russia and Ukraine. We know that. Uh, I think the idea was President Erdogan to try to mediate uh, is a good one. Uh, but uh, it's up to the government. I, I'm not in a position to announce any official position on this proposal. But I do think this is not uh, uh, something we should be completely ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, as, as, as coming to an energy, uh, Turkey is very important. They very smart policy of Turkish government do, uh, in the course of uh, more than uh, 10 years uh, resulted in a situation when Turkey is now uh, a very important hub of uh, uh, supplying of natural gas. Uh, 
I would like to mention as well TANAP project bringing uh, Azeri gas from Caspian Basin through Turkish territory to Europe. And Turkish stream, uh, that's another project. Uh, 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 I remember this uh, 1st December 2014, uh, Putin visit to Ankara when he announced the beginning of this project. Uh, uh, we don't see, uh, we see this project as well as political. At that time, uh, it was uh, quite acceptable for Turkey to, uh, to build it. Uh, it is built. Uh, but as far as I know, I'm, I'm not responsible, I cannot say right now uh, in January, but as generally, it is not being used to full extent. Uh, but it, it is being used. Uh, it's a natural interest of Turkey, country which has no natural uh, gas resources of its own, uh, its desire to play important role uh, in this energy equation. As uh, Turkey is very closely working with Qatar and other countries on LNG, and they were successful in that. So they try to have this portfolio very diversified. If you look at Turkey, they have like six or seven countries supplying gas to Turkey. This is a very smart policy. And they pay particular attention, as far as I know, not to have a Russian part more than 25% approximately, which is a kind of normal. Uh, uh, and uh, that is, uh, uh, that's why they have uh, uh, quite stable supply of gas uh, to country. Uh, definitely, we will continue to work with Turkey. It's a very important country. Uh, and again, as far as I know, the uh, only position of Turkey on this issue, uh, that uh, a conflict between Russia and Ukraine should be resolved in a peaceful manner. Uh, uh, nobody, as I said many times, nobody wants a war uh, in the region which will be devastating for all of us. Uh, talking about, can, can we stay another five minutes? It's okay for I'm you? I'm with you. Okay, because there are other questions. Uh, another question from uh, Nikkei um, uh, in Japan, uh, Francesca Regalado. <coughs> uh, you mentioned that the oil and gas pipelines in Ukraine that could be damaged <clears throat> in the event of war. How would uh, such a, a, a Russian attack to, on Ukraine affect Japan's energy supply and uh, trade relations with both countries? Uh, energy, you, you know, if we, would, if we would sit now 10 years before that date, uh, I would say that, you know, the natural gas is the only commodity in the world which has no world market. It's actually regional. It's, uh, like, divided by oceans. Uh, it is very difficult to supply substantial amount of natural gas uh, in an LNG form on a long distance. Uh, at that time, there were no shale revolution in the United States with cheap gas. There were no enough capacity to, make, to produce LNG and to supply it to the world market. But now, the situation is completely different. Right now, we have a global market for uh, natural gas. Uh, you can sh uh, ship natural gas around the globe, uh, through, uh, and uh, at some point, before this energy crisis in Europe, when I saw figures of how much gas uh, United States supply, where you think, to China, to Asia. I mean, where is Asia, where is the United States? I mean, Europe is closer. But they were, because it's market. I mean, uh, if you would know the, uh, how LNG market works, uh, it's, you have LNG, uh, you have tanker, which moves uh, somewhere, and it can, be, it can change destination 10 times on its route to the, to the port. I mean, because it's a trade. This is, there is uh, uh, traders who sit and they sell it each other, uh, and then finally destination could be nothing to do with the initial one. So that means, that right now the world is interconnected. Uh, and uh, when uh, you have energy crisis in Europe, that means you have energy crisis in Asia simultaneously. Because if Europe feel necessity to buy more gas, they need 200 billion cubic meters of LNG capacity, which is underused. So they go to Qatar and they ask supply more gas. And Qatar would choose supply to Europe or to Asia. So therefore, if you have long-term commitments, that's good for you. But many, uh, many countries, they still trade on a, uh, spot, uh, uh, on a spot uh, uh, model basis. So that is why uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it, it, it is a serious issue. Uh, 
Uh, but let, let me say uh, one more thing, which is very interesting, which is uh, uh, overlooked, as far as I know. That's from Russian press, actually. Commerçant, Gazette, uh, the newspaper Commerçant, if I'm not mistaken, that during this uh, visit of Putin to China, he's going to present to Xi Jinping Sila Sibiri II, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, Sila Sibiri pipeline. But it's a very particular project. I would uh, urge you to look at it, uh, geography. It's again about geography. If Sila Sibiri I was uh, a pipeline uh, connecting new uh, fields of gas to China, Sila Sibiri II begins at the same place exactly on Yamal from where gas going to Europe from Nord Stream 2. The same place. Okay, and if you look at figures, Yes, uh, amount of gas Russia extracts now a little bit bigger, but not enough to fill Sila Sibiri II with 55 billion cubic meters. Amazingly, the same number. If, if it is true, and we will see that uh, in, uh, uh, during the Putin's visit to China, that means that Russia will be constructing a pipeline which will actually a 100% alternative to uh, Nord Stream 2 in case something happens with Europe. Uh, <laughs> but maybe they have uh, plans. I, I'm not aware. I've tried to find out whether they have plans to double production in Yamal. I'm somehow I'm a little bit doubt about that. But that is a very particular project in terms of uh, where it begins and where it will. And will go, this project, Nord Stream 2, not just to China, but to Korea huh. and to North Korea, too. <clears throat> That's amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, are there other questions? Nikki. No, Nikki, sorry. Yes, no, sorry. NHK. Thank you, Mr. Korsensky. This is Namich Nohara from NHK. Just one question. Uh, what do you feel about the reaction of the Japanese government toward the situation? Oh, yes, I did yeah. answer. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, what we understand, uh, that we understand that uh, during recent discussion of uh, and recent online uh, summit between United States and Japan, President Biden discussed with uh, Prime Minister Kishida a lot of questions, in, in Ukraine included. And from what we saw in statements, that Japan is very carefully considers the situation around Ukraine, uh, very uneasy about the situation, and Japan is ready to consider its own measures uh, if. Uh, uh, another wave of aggression will begin. Uh, we believe that uh, Japan can play a very, uh, uh, very important role in that. Uh, Japan is the only G7 country which is uh, 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 the only Asian country which is part of G7 efforts. The Japan is the only country in Asia which uh, introduced sanctions against Russia in 2015. And if we remember who was foreign minister at that time and who was announcing those sanctions, that's Prime Minister Kishida. So uh, we, uh, uh, that means he understands what is going on. Uh, we understand that there is a strong desire on the Japanese uh, side to develop relations with Ukraine. First of all, we consider these relations in, air, in, uh, in part of economy. We want uh, uh, very comprehensive and deep relations in economy. We want to start negotiations on free trade. We would like to uh, sign new convention on double taxation treaty. We have several infrastructural projects on table to discuss with the Japanese government, which is under consideration. Uh, for, for us, the best support from Japan could come from economic side. Uh, and uh, it is not just uh, economy. Uh, if Japan will, Japan is a soft superpower. Many countries in the world look at Japan's reaction to the situation. If Japan would go forward with economic development, that will be a signal for many other countries that it, it's okay to, to work with Ukraine because, as you know, investors, they are very cautious normally. So uh, we would like uh, Japan to play a very comprehensive and constructive role in that. Uh, that would be the most important uh, issue for us. Thank you. Okay. If we don't have uh, other questions, I think we we'll, uh, can finish here. Allow me just your prediction, Ambassador because uh, we are all concerned, of course, about this situation. Do you really think that war is going on? I don't want to I mean... Are you uh, optimistic uh, or <laughs> pessimistic? Uh, I'm optimistic. Okay. I believe that full-scale war 
uh, it's it very, very, very uh, difficult to expect, but uh, we may uh, see uh, more localized uh, conflict. Unfortunately, uh, we, uh, as our partners uh, and media say, it's not my words, but they say that probably Putin needs to save his face, to, to go out of this, so he needs something. Uh, he needs political solution, and which he accepts, or uh, some kind of military. But uh, if it comes to military terms, let me tell you, we are very much ready. Our army is very well prepared. And uh, uh, you have uh, a population which is very well motivated. It's absolute <coughs> nonsense to think, uh, as some uh, Russian analytics say, that once uh, we see uh, approaching of Russian forces, there will be uprising, there will be change in the government, no way. Just simply forget about this, 81%. The latest poll shows 81%. Uh, they, they don't want anything to do with uh, idea to be returned to Russian sphere of influence. Uh, we want peaceful, secure, and uh, uh, safe Ukraine. So that is, that is the most important. So uh, we will uh, do whatever possible to avoid conflict. Uh, I don't want to speculate. It is very dangerous to make announcements, and I would I would rather not to do that. Uh, but we are very uneasy. We we are getting prepared every day. Everything possible we do to get ourselves ready for military uh, uh, assault. But at the same time, we work hard to find a diplomatic solution. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, let me remind you all that tomorrow we have another important event here at the Foreign Press, uh, Foreign Correspondent Club. We will have two former prime ministers, Mr. Koizumi, Junichiro, and uh, Naoto, Kan Naoto. They came also last year, as you may remember. Uh, they are both on the against nuclear movement right now, very active. And uh, they will talk about the proposed up to now, uh, EU, EU plan to consider nuclear, to reconsider nuclear energy as a sustainable possibility of energy. Thank you very much. And uh, Ambassador, we much. usually uh, offer a one year membership um, um, card to our guest speakers. Uh, but uh, our staff who is in charge of this is presently sick on leave. So when it will be ready, our staff will, I will send it grateful. to the ambassador. I would, to the ambassador. I would be very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.